Today, everybody's trying to apply science, math, AI to sales, and that's a good thing. The problem is that we're basing it off of conventional, intuitive logic. That's the bad thing. We're viewing every person out there, every company as a persona that has the same likelihood of buying as everyone else. We think of things in the context of averages. What's the average likelihood of this? And then we are obsessed with activity, but activity for activity's sake without real judgment and uh, experience applied to it and focus. Today, we're going to be talking about this. And this is clearly my favorite topic because every time I get called into an account, I see this. When it doesn't work, they double down on what's not working instead of taking a step back and figuring out what does work. Sales is, especially the more complex it is, the more of an intellectual exercise it is. Too many of us get locked in the activity trap. Now, activity alone works well when it, everything is equal, but that's rare. Maybe if you have a bunch of customers already and you're selling renewals or printer cartridges, then activity is great. It's hounding people. It's reminding people. It's expediting things. But that may be your case, but is that selling or is that servicing or proactively expediting? Most of us are trying to get into new accounts. We're trying to build big deals. We're trying to determine how to best spend our time. And that's judgment. That's knowledge. That comes from experience and evaluating and thinking which we really don't get to do in sales because that's not a KPI. We can't measure quality. We can only measure quantity. And this is killing us. And I really want you to pass this episode on to your manager because we're going to be focusing on the 80-20 rule. <clears throat> now, I know you're going to say to yourself, I know what that is. That's not the problem. The problem isn't you knowing what it is. The problem is you applying it to what you do. Because knowing it uh, kind of almost hurts you because you think you've got it. You think you have it. You think you understand it and you're applying it. But look at your day. Look at the number of hours you have. Let's say you have you know, a 10-hour work day on your own. You decide that. Let's just use that for math. 20% or two hours will generate 80% of the results, the outcome. Now, it also works recursively, and we'll get into this in the interview, and I'll sum up the, the math part at the end, but it's, it's really not that difficult. Don't let the math get in the way of the logic, because if you understand this and you accept it, and then you apply it, that you really think through your deals. If I have 10 deals, uh, two of them are going to generate 80% of the revenue, and then you divide it or you apply it again to the 20% that generate the 80% and on recursive down and down and down. And then all of a sudden you'll understand how you should allocate your time, your energy, and your resources. Too many of us react to what either our manager tells us to do, our customers tell us to do, whatever happens to be going on. The hottest thing right now, and that's human nature. That's not uh, stupidity. That is intuitive behavior. And it is the rare person that really applies this. And this is why I've always thought that lazy salespeople do better in sales. Why? Because they're not going to waste their time. They're going to judge and determine what is most likely to close based off of a pattern. And, and this is intelligence. Instead of the 10x thing, and I got into this debate with somebody on LinkedIn, and I go, the 10x is it's what I call chum for idiots, meaning that it encourages you to do a lot of activity without really focusing on what the outcome is. And they say, well, you could do it 10 times smarter. 
And it's like, well, are you really going to do something 10 times smarter? How about focusing on the 20% and then the 20% of that? Come bring, boil it down to the one thing, then the, the second thing. And don't get to the second thing until you've done the one thing. Why does this work? Because you're, you're basically constantly betting our time, whether you admit it or not. Your manager might be betting your time, but they're not really thinking. They're assuming that those 50 calls a day are all A-level calls. But if you did triage on them, if you analyze them to determine which ones are worth the time, and if they're worth the time, would you invest the time in them? Do the research. Find out what they really care about. Of course, we don't do that. Why? Because it takes all day to do 50 calls. And it becomes this insanity that we see happening. And this has been happening in marketing all along. Uh, not until recently where people are applying uh, technology and focus into account-based marketing, where people are really analyzing the market and like, who are we really going after? And I bet nine times out of 10, and I got a, a podcast coming about this on the B2B Revenue Leadership Show about it, is that people pick too high typically, too many, almost always, uh, too long-term deals, not within the window of the comp plan. And what we're missing is the analytical part. And I always, you know, as a rep would say, you know, I'd take a strategy day or a strategy afternoon where I would like go through my deals. And my manager was like, that's an afternoon off. Don't, don't, yeah, you couldn't tell a manager that, that you're going to strategize. Because they, they look at that as laziness as opposed to intelligence. Let's get into the review because I love this topic. I'll sum it up at the end. Uh, before we do, make sure you're checking out our partners, CoVideo, for video email. The people who have used it are really sending me uh, video emails now saying they appreciate it. It is the way to cut through here in 2019. Also, Pipe Drive is just cooking great content, and a great product. Uh, you get 60 days free with the Brutal Truth coupon code. And those of you who are in the course, I'll sum it up uh, at the end and uh, give you an update on the office hours as well as the one-on-ones at the end of the podcast. Here we go. Hey, Perry, welcome to the show. As a way of getting started, give us a little background on yourself. Well, I am the guy who got fired from his engineering job, laid off actually, and uh, went into sales. <laughs> And, um, and I remember my friend Frank telling me, you know, Perry, you don't just stick a pencil behind your ear and start a whole new career. You know, there's a lot of, I was like, oh, you know, th those guys aren't really that smart, you know? And <laughs> well, then, you know, add in two years of bologna sandwiches and ramen soup and pounding the pavement <laughs> and trying to get into see purchasing agents and engineering managers and 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 manufacturers directories and <clears throat> and accomplishing nothing at trade shows and all of that kind of nonsense um i got fired from that sales job about year two that I'll, I'll never forget i walked in the door of my house after i got fired and my wife looks up and she goes you got fired <laughs> now, how she knew that well and who knows how she knew that? Yeah. I mean, it was it wasn't like I it was an outside sales job, so it wasn't inconceivable for me to stop by the house in the morning. But she knew. So, um, so eighty twenty sales and marketing is the book that I wish that I'd had back then. And well, boy, there's. There's a lot of nonsense that had to get pounded out of my head before I was ready to listen and a lot of pain that had to be applied to my, my skull yeah. and, you know, various parts of my body. Um, so, um, you know, so, so what happened, the, the next job I got was actually a much better fit. And, um, and this was in 1997 and they had a website and they sold nationwide and engineers were already starting to use the internet fairly seriously in their jobs. And without fully realizing it at the time, 
um, I was being welcomed into the world of online marketing. And, um, and four years later, we, we, we had grown that part of the company 2000% and sold it for $18 million to a public company. And I parachuted out with some stock options. And I said to myself, Hmm, I wonder what would happen if I actually got good at this. Because I knew that in the land of the blind, the man with one eye gets to be king. And I knew that selling industrial automation hardware was the land of the blind. And I could certainly make a living there, you know, but again, what if I got really good? You know, I would say my, by my standards now, my skill set, then was maybe a four or a five on a scale of one to 10. And I was in a market that was a three or a four on a scale of how much potential it really had. Yeah. Well, what happens if you're a seven skill set in a seven level opportunity? Or what happens if you're a nine skill set in a nine level opportunity? And um, so here we are cool. and I'm talking to you. Yeah. Now, I love your stuff. It's very much aligned with my view. Uh, our back our backgrounds are very similar. I came out of software engineering yeah, and, and went into sales because I saw how much money they were making. Mm-hmm. And I was working, I was doing the 16 hours a day, uh, but I was making probably a quarter of what the sales reps were making. Yeah. And I'm like, and they would bring me on the calls because I was the, the guy who was presentable enough to give the demo and answer the questions. Mm-hmm. And I go, well, I can get the meeting and I can introduce myself. There can't be much more to it. But what I love (laughs) about your stuff is that it is counterintuitive. I think because I talk to sales leaders all day, pretty much every day. It's all about activity, KPIs, not accomplishment, not quality, and not adding judgment to what people are doing. Because that's what 80-20 forces you to do. It forces you to think not just act. Well, if it makes you feel any better, (laughs) pretty much everywhere in the world runs that way. Like science, for example, I've got a whole set of science projects and I can tell you that science is run on KPIs. How many papers did you publish? It doesn't really seem to matter to an awful lot of people how much substance was actually the like, did you actually discover anything? Like, is there anything new and profound here? Right. But so anyway, this is par for the course for the human race is people are just checking boxes. It's in every industry that you can possibly imagine. It's not just us. Okay. And, and, you know, the, the, the key word that you said there was counterintuitive. And, and the fact is, is that anything that is effective, almost by definition will be counterintuitive because what is effective is never what is average. Yes. Average is equals ineffective, right? Uh, If, if, if all the kids in class take a history test and the average is 77, then that means the average kid for all practical purposes is ineffective in history because they have no competitive advantage. And there's one kid in the class, one kid in the class is going to do more history in his life than the other 29 put together, that's a fact. And you're always looking at the outliers. So every, really everything in your life that really works um, in a big way is going to have a major counterintuitive element to it. Even, even though it may follow certain rules and certain models and certain best practices. Well, that's it. I mean, for, for me and what pushed me towards it was I hated wasting time. The idea of flying somewhere that you find out isn't qualified, they're not motivated, there's no pain, there's no, they're just curious. So I was flying in to educate (laughs) or, um, you know, seeing somebody do better than me who wasn't either working as hard as me or as smart as me, that would irritate me. Yes. Maybe the middle child syndrome. So. I've always found sales to be an intellectual exercise versus an activity exercise. And I think the activity yes. distracts us from what works. Well, Richard Koch um, quotes, I think it was actually Bill Bain, who I believe said this, that action drives out thought. Yes. Now, when I was in my 20s, 
um, it, the same, the era where I had the sales job and I, and I was, I, I was in Amway and I, and I picked up this slogan from the MLM world, which was massive action solves every problem. No, 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 no. The de- you know, okay. The definition of sanity is doing what you've always done and expecting different. No, you, you know what the like insanity squared is, is doing what didn't work before even harder. Yes. That's sales it, logic. That is, that is sales logic because I go in and if 50 calls a day doesn't work, you've got to do a hundred. And it's like, well, wait a second. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's drill down on who is most likely, who could be interested. And people, that thinking, that exercise irritates a lot of people because it requires thinking. Most and, people don't like to think. And if you asked, because I listen to podcasts all the time, oh, what's the one piece of advice? And the answer 80% of the time is hard work. And I'm like, oh, brother. That, what kind of advice like, is that? Well, first of all, does anybody not know that hard work is highly correlated with success? I think everybody knows that. But there's everyone at Walmart, McDonald's, uh, every warehouse, every minimum wage job. I bet they're working hard. I, I, I would probably love to see some studies, but I don't think hard work is highly correlated with success. I think hard work is moderately correlated with success. I mean, I do think that, um, you know, in certain, there's certain parts of a craft where it really requires a tremendous amount of perfection. You know, if you're going to be a world-class bass player, then you're going to spend your time in the woodshed. But even then, you know, the question is, well, are you, are you just going through the motions and spending time or are you actually moving that envelope of your skill level every time you sit down and play? Right. And, and if you're going to do that, well, nobody, nobody, you're, you're not just going to like put a bunch of sheet music in front of yourself or watch a bunch of YouTube videos and just mindlessly go through it. You're going to have to have to have a strategy and you're almost certainly going to need a music teacher or a coach uh, even Michael Jordan needs a coach, right? Yeah. So, um, so well, so the good news is, is not very many people think this way. Um, and, well, and that's good. So, <laughs> it reduces the amount of competition. 80-20 is like black belts. It's like there's first degree, second degree, third degree. And every, all the way to ninth, and every step, you're you're doing yet another thing that is counterintuitive, yet another thing that is completely countercultural. Out of your comfort zone, and well, I mean that's how people become billionaires. I, I've never met a, a billionaire that thinks in a conventional fashion. No, so. I, I think the problem with it is people think it's enough to know of it versus applying oh, heavens. it. You you need to you you need to have eighty twenty in your bones and in, in your in your muscle memory, but you also need an intellectual understanding of what it actually is. So the first time that I remember applying 80, 20 to a business situation, I, I, it was in the software company that got sold. Um, and I was reading in some book and it said 20% of your customers produce 80% of your sales and, and, and vice versa. And, and I thought, is that true? And I printed out a QuickBooks report and I got out my calculator and I went down from top to bottom and I was like, I'll be darned. When I got 20% of the way down, it was 80% of the money. And I, I had this kind of vague realization that there was this guy named Dimitri who would call me up every few months and basically waste my time. And he would only spend about three to $5,000 a year and he would bust my balls about features we didn't have and all this kind of stuff. And, <laughs> and I realized that I should probably just tell him to go buy from the competition and be done with the guy because time would be better spent with these yeah. other people. But 
that was so counter to my Protestant work ethic training right. that I never did that. Um, and, and so the meaning of 80-20, so then I just went on, right, and kind of ignored it. But, but the, 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 when things kicked in was I read Rich's Kasha's book, The 80-20 Principle, which somebody urged me, he's like, you've got to read this book. And I read this book. And, and on page 14, he goes, 80-20 has a lot to do with fractals and chaos. And then he just goes on. And I'm like, wait a minute. Fractals and chaos is when you have patterns within patterns within patterns within patterns. Like a tree has a branching pattern all the way from 100 feet down to a microscopic on a leaf. There's the branching, branching. And I was like, wait a minute. Is he actually suggesting? I think what that would mean is that there's an 80-20 inside the 80-20 and then another one and another one. And it, it, it could go on almost infinitely. And I was like, what is that? And I jumped up out of the coffee shop and I ran home and I, I, my, my business was a year and a half old. Okay. And when your business is a year and a half old, think about how much data you've accumulated, which is some, but not much. Yeah. Right. How many sales and the customers and the clients and all the stuff. And so I had a few clients and, and then I was also, I was sending out these audio CDs and I was driving traffic to my website. It was all very nascent and, and stuff. And, and I, 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 I had all these papers and reports in the calculator and I'm in the living room and I'm, and I'm just having this like orgasmic epiphany, like, Oh my goodness. Like I could literally predict like if I'd known 80-20 a year ago, I could have predicted what was going to happen this year. I wouldn't have known where it was going to happen, but I would know what happened. I would know how big it's going to be and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, my word. And, and now what it also meant, it also meant that 80-20 was a law of nature it wasn't just this thing that a certain group of business people or economics people happen to find handy. Okay. It is a, it is a universal law of cause and effect like gravity. It's okay. just more abstract than gravity. It's less obvious, but it's just as true. Um, and it's like everything. I mean, it, it, you know, the, it's, it's the birds on the Galapagos islands and it's craters on the moon. And it's, 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 return customer returns for defective products it's all 80 20 and so my mind was just on fire and and you know there's just there's not many times in your life when something way out at the edges of your awareness suddenly becomes the center of the universe and everything around you has to reorient your itself but that's exactly what happened and so it was like wow if you understand, if you really understand 80-20, then you, you have this easy way to explain almost anything that works in business strategy, almost anything that works in marketing, or even, even copywriting, or Google advertising, or yeah. any of that stuff. And, and I was, um, very shortly after that, I started writing my Google Ads book. And I, I understood, like, what clicked in place was Perry. Really, all you do in a Google account is you just start applying 80-20 and then applying it again and applying it again. And you take every different column and you sort, you sort from top to bottom. And then you ask, so what 80-20 operation do I need to do on this column, which means I need to change this over here. And then I sort by the next one. And I can optimize. I can get... I can get to 90 or 95% optimization only touching 25% of the system. Yep. And, and, and well, that's what business is. Entrepreneurs raise things from areas of low value to the areas of high value. And the way they do it is by applying 80, 20. And like, even if you've never heard of 80, 20 before in, in your entire life, and even if you're making $400,000 a year and you've been selling for 30 years, you've been applying 80-20. Whether you know it or not. Whether you know it or not. But once you know it. Yeah. See, see for me, 
it, it really hit home. Uh, my company got acquired by this Fortune 20 company. And I was at this kickoff meeting and they were talking about their business. There's a $130 billion business. And they got, um, you know, 20% of their revenue from eight clients. Yes. <laughs> and yes. you're like, no, 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 no. It's got to be spread out more than that. And they're like, right. No. <laughs> right. So they had, you know, these small account teams on these huge, enormous accounts. And then everybody else. And wow. Yeah. And when you think about how people spend their time, because you apply it to time, which is the critical, because that's our only real resource that we have, mm -hmm. our time and what we do with it. Yeah. You know, and what do people do? They look at the eight or 10 hours as equal. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not so equal, is it? Further from the truth. 1% of your time is 50% of your value, right? If, you, if you're on straight commission, half the money you made last year, you made in three to five days. And that, that really becomes recursive. Now, the, the issue that I try and get with sales leaders is that competence in a company grows linearly, but incompetence grows exponentially. <laughs> That's true. So what, um, what happens? Does every company, oh, we want to double our revenue next year. So they just extrapolate the 2x, 2x marketing spend, 2x hiring, 2x enablement. And all of a sudden it, it only gets you 20, 30% increase because incompetence is growing. Competence is just linearly moving up. And what this does, this, you know, I, I try and focus them on prices law, which kind of gives it a, a different view because it's different. 80, 20 people, they think they just, because they know what it means, they think they know it and they're applying it. The applying part is what's missing. They look so, at it in the rearview mirror, not in the windshield. Well, so so eighty twenty means that sales and marketing is a disqualification process, not a convincing people process. It means that it's a needle and haystack exercise, and it's about the needles, not the haystack. So my my friend John Mendocha came up with this brilliant set of rules called the five power disqualifiers and the five power disqualifiers. Well, so here's the story. So John was a professional gambler for three and a half years in Vegas and he was involved in organized crime and, 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 <laughs> and all kinds of crazy stuff. And one day he's sitting in a restaurant booth with a couple of guys and they're having an argument and they're like, yes, you will. No, I won't. Yes, you will. And out comes a Glock. And the guy plants it on the other guy's head and he's like, yes, you will. And John's sitting across the table from these guys and John's like, dude, if you don't get out of here, it's going to be you one of these times. And he just, he just walked. Um, he was 21 and he got a job in Southern California selling um, electronic hardware and his boss plunks 206 leads down on his desk and he goes, John, go see all these guys and close some deals. Yep. All right. So John, John has worked as a professional gambler in various and sundry other tasks for, from age 17 to 21 in Las Vegas, working with, shall we say, extraordinarily pragmatic people. Okay. And John, <laughs> John has acquired a fair amount of street smarts and John knows there is no way 206 of these people are worth going to see. Or so he comes, yeah. he, he comes up with these five questions um, and these became the five power disqualifiers. And here's what they are. Number one, do they have the money? If they don't have the money, they're not buying the stuff. If they don't have the budget, they're not buying the stuff. Now, as rudimentary as that sounds, I s held hands and saying kumbaya with wonderful people that didn't have the money. And I just thought. What, what do most reps think? If they talk to me, they're qualified. Oh, <laughs> so have the money. Number two, do they have a bleeding neck? Okay, so 
if you break your arm, you go to the emergency room and you think you've got an emergency. And then a lady gives you a clipboard and sits you down with some good housekeeping magazines. And an hour and a half later, you're still sitting there with your broken arm waiting for somebody to call your name, right? But then a guy with a gunshot wound with blood squirting out of his aorta <laughs> comes right. in yeah. and, he, and they, they send him right in, right? Like their definition of emergency and your definition of emergency, well, People spend money when they're having an emergency. So that's bleeding that. Okay. Number three, they have the ability to say yes and not merely the ability to say no. And once again, as common sense as that may seem, I don't know. I can't tell you how many, you know, I go talk to some junior engineer and he likes me. And I like him, and I spent an hour and a half with a guy, and he's like, well, I'm going to need to go show this to my boss. And then I immediately know, well, he's not going to show it. He's going to talk to his boss about this for seven minutes, and he's not going to understand what I spent an hour and a half training. And we have to start all over, yeah. right? Okay, so yeah. Billy is say yes. Number four, they buy into your unique selling proposition, like your way of doing stuff not just a way of doing stuff, right? And then last, it fits their overall plans. Now, this is actually a very, very deep thing. And if you take the five power disqualifiers and you methodically apply them, first of all, it takes all the pressure out of the sale because your posture towards the customer is, hey, look, I'm not here to convince you of anything. Frankly, I got to ask you a bunch of questions before I even know if I'm going to stay here and talk to you. So, right. And it, it, it totally shifts the energy of the meeting. And th there's an online version of this too, which I use a lot. Um, and it's, it's a, it's like, it's giving a quiz. So for example, we've got a quiz called is Facebook for me.com. We got a quiz called is AdWords is Google AdWords for me. And so like is FB for me.com, you go there and you answer a dozen questions and it gives you a scale from one to 10, like on a scale of one to 10, how good is Facebook advertising a fit for your business? Are you a 3.6? Are you a 6.9 or, or an 8.7? Well, a person doesn't have to play with that very long to make it very clear we're not taking everybody and we're not trying to get everybody. We want seven, eights, and nines. We don't care about fours and fives, right? And that's a great lead generation tool. Like, should you be doing this or should you just hightail it out of here and go do something else? Because you know the Facebook reps is going to tell you to do it. Yeah. Of but I'm right, I'm not I'm not gonna tell you that. And it 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 earns trust. Um, and and so what you end up then is you only end up talking to at most 20% of the people and very often maybe only 5%. And you actually only um, invest a significant amount of time with one or two or 3%. And you have a high rate of sales. And there is a, there is a constructive virtue to a certain kind of laziness. 80-20 um, is about saying no. More often than you say yes. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to switch into this mentality when you're already desperate, you know, and you're eating peanut butter and pimento cheese sandwiches for dinner. But it, you, you have to start adopting the mindset right away. I will not waste my time with people who are just going to waste my time. I would rather uh, sit on a park bench by the river than go talk to somebody who's never going to buy. Right, because people don't feel comfortable sitting down and strategizing with a, a, a notepad or an iPad or thinking through what makes those five things. They Who think it's lazy, and they don't want their boss to see them doing it. No, because that's not work. Well, it's not. They don't right, think it's, it's not work. work. Their definition. But, you know, I spend every morning when I get up, I spend two hours in my notebook. Now, a whole bunch of that is really meditation, prayer, journaling, getting myself centered, and only some of it is strategizing. However, it doesn't 
it, it frankly doesn't matter like what I tell you that it is. It is me getting myself right yeah. before I go out and face the world. Okay. And I would say that when I am working, I am very effective and I, I'm one of the most expensive I'm one of the most expensive business consultants in the world and people fly in from all over the world to come to my seminars. And, and I am, and this is actually true of the very best, most of the very best salespeople too. I am actually more of an artist than a business person and the art happens in concentrated doses at somewhat unpredictable times. Okay. I am not a workhorse. I am not a machine in the very best people in any profession. They are, are ditto. I don't care if we're, you're talking about like the best sales guy at IBM, or if we're talking the best professor at Harvard medical school or any high level people, they are all, in some sense, artists. They're not just guys who turn cranks. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, like, the, the word artist, of course, has all these, you know, um, starving artist and all these connotations. But I, I'm asking you to just contextualize it in a completely different way. Well, it, it, where you come up with original ideas, where you are thinking and analyzing and reflecting on what is important and what is going to work. Yes. I think today uh, salespeople think just because of the automation that they're effective. They're busy. I call it doing dumb things faster. And well, that's, exact, that's exactly what it is. And, and now in 1998, man, you had an email and a CRM and, and a website and stuff, man, you were like, Man, you got a sledgehammer, man. Yeah, like, it, yeah it took you all the 30 the, minutes to find their phone number. And right. You couldn't figure but, out their email address. You'd be like, I don't even know who it is. Never mind their email address. <laughs> so if you, were good for, if you were good with those tools 15 or 20 years ago, you were slaying oh, dragons. But, but it's not true anymore, right? It's, oh. There's a whole level of thinking, and it's strategic, and it's not mechanical. Um, and so... So yeah, 80, 80, 20 is an art form. Um, uh, one of my favorite sayings is art is science with more than seven variables. And what do you mean by that? Well, when there's always a point of where the complexity is going to get anywhere, starting with, well, let's start with $3 pieces of pizza and work our way up from there. Like they're going to have a trillion gigabytes of data and not know what to do with it. Right. So you, you have to, like, you have to take a step back and you have to make generalizations, okay? And so, so here, here's an example of a brilliant generalization uh, is what is a star business. Um, uh, Boston Consulting Group came up with this maybe 50 years ago. Which companies are going to grow and make most of the profits, which 20% of the companies are going to make 80% of the profits. It's, it's all the companies that are number one in a market that's growing 10% a year or more. Now that is unbelievably reliably true. It is also a massive, brilliant, elegant simplification of a trillion pieces of data. Yeah. Like there's literally a trillion pieces of data involved in that, but you can distill it down to number one market growing 10%, which by the way, um, by the way, that tells you, that tells you what, what company to go get a job at. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's people listening to us today and they're trying to get a job or they're thinking about a new one or whatever work for a company that's number one in its niche growing 10% a year or more. If they're number four, don't work there. Yeah. Now, now you have to, you have to be very, you have to be very mindful of what you mean by niche. Okay. 
it, I mean, it, it, there's a ton of nuance to this. You, we could spend years on it, but like, is there, is, is the, like the, the diamond tip saw blade of that business is the diamond tip saw blade um, a like, okay, let's use cars. For example, let's use cars 10 or 12 years ago. For example, um, everybody has a car, but only a few manufacturers have a car with an iPod station in it. Okay. Well, you're not number one in the car market, but you're number one in cars with, with iPhone plugins, then you're, you're completely differentiated on this one point and you're number one in, in the market of people who want an iPhone station in, in their car. That's, that's what I need. And, and well, you, and you're going to have to understand the company's business in order to make that judgment. And you're going to have to ask them some very smart questions in order to understand that. Because if you're just looking at their website or you heard about it on monster.com or something, you're not going to know. And everybody's going to tell you, Oh, we're number one in this and number one in that. Right. But if, but if you really find out, right. well, so now guess what? Going to instead of with and, and notice, yeah. notice what happens when you do that. You're disqualifying them. Yes. You're not yeah. trying to sell them. They're like, well, this, you know, we, we had all these applicants and they, uh, they asked us all these questions or we asked them all these questions, but I had one guy that just pummeled us with questions. Yeah. Right. Well, that's like a whole switch the game, whole different deal. Take, give control or take it. If they, if they don't like guys that ask questions, you don't want to work there. Yeah. Cool. Hey, this has been a great conversation. Um, where would you like people to go to connect with you, get your book, and learn more about your work? You can go to sell8020.com, and you can get 8020 sales and marketing for a penny plus shipping. And that's 7 bucks in the U.S. and 14 outside of the U.S. Um, or you could go to Amazon and pay full price for it. But if you buy it on my website, um, you will get some additional tools and videos and trainings that people who buy the book elsewhere don't get. And you'll also get to watch how I sell and how I work. Um, Sell8020.com. Um, and this, this book will change your life. I, I was having beers with a friend who's not from my business circles, um, but who is getting ready to get an MBA at Northwestern next year. And I said, Todd, this book is as valuable as a year of MBA school. And I looked him right in the eye and he goes, you're serious. I said, I am heart attack serious. Yeah. This book is as valuable as a year of MBA school. Now you go, why would you sell a year of MBA school of value for $7? Well, buy it and find out <laughs> <laughs> and see if I am telling you the truth. And if you decide that I am a flim flam man, then you can unsubscribe and you can banish me from your world. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think you're going to like it. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that. How do you apply it every day? Apply it first to your time. Wow. What is the top thing that you need to do and do a Sophie's choice on the items. If you only were able to get one thing done, which would it be, A or B? Now, this requires analytics. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you have to choose. And this forcing you to choose will develop your judgment skills. This is how we do it. Now, let's say you don't do it and you end up doing the easy one or the one that interrupts you or the one you most like to do. Does it get you the result that you want? Uh, when you look in at your to-dos, uh, out of them, how do you sort them? How about your pipeline? If your pipeline looks like just this database list, you really have to triage this. Now, imagine an emergency room if they didn't do triage. You get one person with a hangnail and somebody who cut off a limb. Now, they're not equal, certainly not in urgency. Uh, you have They sort on urgency. We have to sort on time of closure. Why? Uh, because we get paid on commission. If it doesn't close, uh, the commission is $0. That's why we should do it on time of closure. Because if it closes outside of our comp plan, we typically don't get paid on it. 
It gets just to add it to our quota. We have to be ruthless with our time, ruthless with our resources. And this judgment skill is the difference between the A and the A minus player. You'll see, I, I see sales reps all the time. Uh, you know, they show me their pipeline or their prospecting list, and it's hundreds and hundreds. And they really need to close 10 deals a year to crush their number. And what, what you have to do is focus down, focus down, focus down. And it doesn't mean you don't swap them in and out if one you find out isn't qualified, the timing isn't right, they've already picked somebody else, the likelihood of a closing is near zero, get it. But we have to be ruthless. Nature puts us on the build a huge list, do more, but that doesn't get us the results. The activity thing in the complex sale works against us, not with us. And what ends up happening is we, we get busy, but we don't get results. And you got to judge this. And now is probably a great time to do it. So, if, hey, if you're in the courses, I really focus on how to do this, both on the deals, how to qualify them, how to really analyze them. And most of this can be done without talking to them. You can do it on the internet. You can see the number of employees, their revenue, their growth rate, what departments are growing in, what products are they already using. Uh, you know, do they do the the points of contact look and feel and act like the ones that we are successful with? You know, if you sell to to younger people and the person's in their sixties, uh, probably not an A, maybe a B. This skill, this prioritization will make the difference for you because you will spend the time on what will and can close. Now, if you're in the courses already, make sure you're checking out the one-on-ones. Those are included in the course free. Uh, there's no additional charge for them. There's unlimited number of them. There are 30-minute calls where we go about applying the course to your deals. Uh, they're kept 100% confidential. The only thing that's recognizable is the voice. And I'd be happy to, to search the database if there's anybody in the company that would recognize your voice. Don't use names, accounts, and I don't need to know that. Don't need to know what you're selling. It's all about strategy and process because these are the things, not rigid process, but the natural process of how companies buy and how we can control this. Nobody teaches this. Uh, I, I went looking for it when I was in sales. I would interview other sales reps. They, they had a hint of how it works, but none of it was documented. None of it was anything more than war stories or folklore. They were unconsciously competent at it. So I had to observe them, and I learned a lot from them, but it was a lot of field trial and error. And I think my background in software development helped me because in software development, it's all about building an algorithm. Uh, building an equation, building a heuristic, uh, something that you can use over and again, a formula, a recipe. And that's how you become great at sales. Because if you keep doing it with this uh, stimulus response, uh, treasure hunt, uh, what's your likelihood of finding the treasure? Most of us are really good at building interest. And I did a post this week on LinkedIn a video about, you know, good salespeople know how to sell. Great salespeople know how companies buy. And if you don't know how companies buy, you're on the outside looking in. So I teach you how to do that. So make sure you're checking out my YouTube channel as well, Brian Burns Sales on YouTube. You can follow me on LinkedIn. If you have sales questions, check out the Sales Questions Brutally Honest Answers podcast. Cooking there. Appreciate you listening. Tell a friend about the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling podcast. We'll see you next time.